which is very common um, in the transition, for 15 years and had retained female organs. I'm using the terminology that was used within this uh, published case report. So basically still had a uterus as well as ovaries. Uh, he presented to the emergency room with otitis media, so an earache, and was found to have a, quite an elevated blood pressure, as you can see, at 170 over 110. His only medications were atorvastatin, a lipid-lowering cholesterol medication, and intramuscular testosterone. Uh, he was offered admission, but he declined due to concerns about discrimination, which is incredibly common in the transgender population. The fact that he even showed up to the hospital in the first place is actually a bit of a rarity due to concerns about discrimination. Um, he did, however, go to see his GP the next day. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with nephrology, how we calculate kidney function, it's an equation that we use. We draw a blood test to measure what a person's serum creatinine is. But then we also incorporate what their age is. I don't know if it's their sex or their gender, but one or the, and it's a binary, one or the other. Uh, and whether they're African American or not, and how you choose to define that, I don't know either. Um, so basically, um, based on this person's serum creatinine, if they plunked in that he was a man, uh, his GFR, or percentage of kidney function, you can think about that, was 31. If you plunked in uh, that he was female, that the, suddenly the kidney function dropped down to 23%. Um, he had some protein in his urine. He was diagnosed with stage 3 CKD. He was put on a new blood pressure medication and, for whatever reason, unclear why, strongly encouraged to stop his testosterone. It should be, and then it just says his care was transferred to another institution. Not really clear who decided that or why. Um, it was mentioned at this point in the case report that the cause of his kidney disease was not felt to have anything to do with his transition or the fact that he was on testosterone, but the fact that as a toddler he'd been diagnosed with Kawasaki disease, so something that was quite remote. Uh, he was started on a new blood pressure medication. He restarted his testosterone, whether that was on medical advice or he did it himself is unclear, and told to go on a low salt and low protein diet. Of note, the patient had been vegan for a number of years. Months later, as you can see, the kidney function continues to drop, uh, and he was not listed for kidney transplant. At that center, to be listed for a kidney transplant, your GFR, or percentage of kidney function, has to be below 20. Um, if he was considered a man, his GFR was too high, and only if it was female. But for whatever reason, he was not listed. Four months later, things continue to get worse, but still not listed for transplant. So we'll take a pause from that case right now and talk about what do we actually know about gender. So I want to be very clear first about the terminology. Sex and gender are two very different terms. They're commonly used interchangeably and they are not the same thing at all. So sex refers to everything biological, basically down to the DNA. If a person is XX or XY, we won't talk about abnormal karyotypes today. Uh, so physiology, genes, um, DNA, etc. Whereas gender has absolutely nothing to do with your G uh, DNA. Um, or your sex. It's a socially constructed role. And when we talk about masculine or feminine, we're talking about gender. When we talk about male or female, we're talking about sex. So I just want to be very clear on that. And the social scientists are very much ahead of us in healthcare in terms of talking about gender. So when we say, you know, what gender are you? Or what gender, let's, let's incorporate gender into our research. Um, are we talking about gender roles? Are we talking, which is, you know, what kind of job do we do? What kind of responsibilities do we have within our house? Childcare, cooking, mowing the lawn, etc. Gender identity, how we see ourselves as a woman, as a man, as neither, as somewhere in between. Gender relations, what does it mean? Oh, you're a grandfather, then you must do X now. Or you're a daughter, you must do X now. Or institutionalized gender. So, you know, who uh, do laundry detergent commercials target? Who do beer commercials target? So when we talk about gender, it's not as easy, if you will, as talking about sex. So gender roles are socialized from a very early age. This is a current, I mean, you could look up the website, it's right there. Um, so 
I think most of us in the room probably don't think of ourselves so much in a binary as we're one or the other in terms of gender roles, but it's important to recognize that a lot of people do, and certainly a lot of the medical literature is written um, this way. So this is just from about a month ago. It's from the nephrology journals, and they talk about the impact of gender and gender disparities in patients with kidney disease. So the key points are that women have a higher prevalence of having chronic kidney disease, but are less likely to receive dialysis, which is a way of replacing a person's kidney function if your own kidneys are not compatible with life anymore. Women are less likely to start dialysis with a fistula. Um, more women donate kidneys, and fewer women actually receive kidneys in terms of transplant, so there's a disparity there. Um, but despite knowing that there are very specific gender, um, I should say, recommendations for medical care of people who have kidney disease are not gender specific, even though that we know that there are important physiological differences between women and men. So for example, um, in the general population, we have different targets for hemoglobin levels, right? So uh, women have lower, lower levels for hemoglobin rather uh, compared to men. But in the kidney uh, population, even though we see, and these are peritoneal dialysis patients who were followed over a three-year period, that men, which is the top line there, always have higher hemoglobin levels, and women always have lower hemoglobin levels, despite the women giving higher doses of erythrostimulating agents, um, we still just tell everybody they need to reach the same target. We don't take into account whether they're a man or a woman. Similarly, we know that women are more likely to have osteoporosis and get fractures in the general population compared to men. And this certainly holds true in the kidney population as well. Um, and kidney disease arguably can make this significantly, not arguably, it does, it makes things uh, considerably worse. But we have gender blind recommendations. Same thing with cardiovascular care and people starting dialysis. Uh, women, young women are much more likely to die than are. Uh, young men on dialysis, and this flips in the older populations, but we use an age-blind as well as gender-blind recommendations. But you could argue that those three uh, things that I've just talked about are very much related to sex. Like maybe there's something just inherently in terms of estrogen exposure, testosterone exposure. So let's talk about something about medication adherence. So whether you take your medications has absolutely nothing to do with what your DNA is, and everything to do about who you are as a person. So young women, girls and young women, are more likely to lose their kidney transplant, to reject their kidney transplant, compared to boys and young men. So these authors, this is a Canadian study across eight centers, said, well, I wonder if it's because of problems with girls and young women taking their medications. Um, and so they divided their uh, findings up. On your left are basically kids or young teen teenagers, ages 11 to 16, and there are no gender differences in terms of who takes their anti-rejection meds or not. But when you look, and that's probably because their parents tell them to take it, uh, truly. And then when you look at the graph on your right, it's young adults, ages 17 to 24, and you can see that young men are much less likely to take their medications than young women. So we can't blame these increased risks of rejection uh, due to young girls and women not taking their medication. So that's great. OK, it's good that people are starting to look at gender differences in healthcare, adherence, et cetera. But the problem, if you will, with all of this um, is, and these are all 2019 papers that I've just shown you, is that it treats gender as a binary, that either you're a woman, or you're a man, or you're a girl, or you're a boy, and it doesn't really leave any room for anything else. So. But this is just shows how behind the times, if you are, if you'll have, um, believe me, and we are in healthcare compared to general society. So this is from September of 2019, and Mattel, the maker of Barbie, debuts gender neutral dolls. Um, so they have a creatable world. Uh, line, which has just come out. And you know when someone like Mattel is coming out with this, like they're not doing this because it's the right thing to do. They're doing it because they think it'll make money and there's demand for it. Bill C-16 was uh, an amendment to this was passed. This is the Canadian Human Rights Act and uh, Criminal Code. An amendment was passed in May 2016 that added gender identity or expression as a reason that is prohibited that you cannot 
discriminate discriminate against someone based on their gender identity or expression, similar to race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, etc. Um, YYC Pronouns was in November 2019, and this is through U of C, a public lecture, a work, all day workshop that just talked about language um, and how, you know, so long uh, language has been, and I'm not a linguist at all, but has really classified people as a binary and sort of the rationale behind using they and them. And then lastly, CBC Kids even has. Uh, resources for kids um, on, you know, using they, them, and their, and why some people do not want to use the terms he, she, uh, her, his, etc. This is a U of C student. This is actually four years ago now. Uh, Quinn, who spoke to CBC and just said, you know, some Canadians need a third option for gender on the census rather than just having man or woman. Um, and actually, Stats Canada has listened to this. So this was from 2019. Statistics Canada put out a pilot survey. Um, some of you in the audience may or may not have been chosen to, to fill it out. I think if you didn't, you got like a $500 fine and threatened with jail. But anyway, in 2021, this we're all going to be filling this out. Um, so they will ask you, what sex were you assigned at birth? So what does it say on your original birth certificate? Um, and so male or female, and remember this is correct terminology because male and female goes with a person's sex. When you go to question two, which best describes your current identity? It really shouldn't say male or female, it should say man or woman. Um, and then indigenous or another cultural gender minority identity or something else that's not captured. So it's not a very, I mean, it's inclusive, it has you know, it includes everybody. It's not very long or descriptive, but it is something. And then there's a bonus question. So if your current gender identity is different from the sex assigned at birth, so if you are not a cisgender person, cis means that sex and uh, gender, for lack of a better term, match, um, what gender do you currently live as in your day-to-day -day life? And again, it should say man and woman, and, and but anyway, it says male and female. Um, Alberta is the only province in which the cities actually do their own censuses, sensi, not sure what the plural of that word is. Um, so this is from last year, and these were the options that Edmontonians had when they filled out, um, you know, their demographics. Um, so this is pretty good. Uh, so they have eight options, as you can see here. And these are the results. So they're publicly available. And what I, so almost a million people filled it out. Um, and what I think is pretty amazing is that almost 10%, it's like 9.998 when you did the calculation, did not identify as a woman slash girl or man slash boy. Um, as you can see, the vast majority uh, at the bottom here, And I just assume that's because people just didn't feel comfortable putting anything down. And so this it's very real, the fear of discrimination and violence. Um, I don't think we in Calgary were that different from Edmonton. So if one in 10 Edmontonians don't identify as the classic binary, I suspect in Calgary we're pretty similar. Um, it's hard to know if our patient population is reflected here. In some ways, um, people who do not identify as cisgender tend to have more mental health struggles and may be accessing the healthcare system more often. And so perhaps um, non-cisgender people are overrepresented in our uh, patient population. It's also possible that they are underrepresented in our paper patient population. Because as I said, the fear of violence and discrimination is very real. Um, and so they may just not want to access and come and see us in the first place. There is some research about, um, you know, really not categorizing people based on gender. So do you have to say you're transgender? Do you have to say you're gender fluid? Do you have to say you're a woman? Do you have to say you're a man? So this is a group um, that has actually talked about representing gender diversity. So some people would argue that working outside the home is a very masculine characteristic. And there are sociologists who do classify that. So by definition, the fact that we're all here, we all have a job outside the home, we're we're on the masculine scale of side, which, but I don't think we'd all identify as a man per se. 
So what this group does is they talk about first order gender scale that's across the top. Um, and in general, how do you see yourself from a scale of zero to six? So, excuse me. <coughs> Um, where you're very feminine, which is, uh, or sorry, in femininity, like not at all, that's a zero, and all the way to very, and same with masculine. But then they also look at the third order gender scale. So in general, how do people see you? So um, you could think about it. Let's say I think of, my, so I should have said my pronouns are she and her. I think of myself as a woman. Um, but you could see the stress level I could have if everyone in this room only saw me as a man. I could find that very stressful. And there actually are studies that show that cis women, um, in terms of self-rated health, um, my self-rated health is more closely tied to how other people, not me in particular, but cis women, how other people see um, them. Whereas in cis men, cis men's self-rated health is more closely tied to their first order gender, uh, gender scale. So um, basically how masculine, how well they feel they, in quotation, match um, in terms of masculinity and sex. These people also ask, this, these researchers ask people uh, what their sex uh, assignment at birth had been, as well as ask their categorical gender identification. And basically, and I think none of us is probably surprised by this, so they looked at about a thousand people. Um, their population was not necessarily that generalizable. They used, um, people signed up, so they used a population where people signed up uh, and were paid to fill out surveys. So most of them were fairly young, college educated, um, and so maybe not representative of our uh, population. But anyway, as you can see, Regardless of whether you were assigned male or female at birth, people were across the spectrum. So the top bar graph here is feminine scale, and the bottom graph here is masculine scale. So just to say that we are a very diverse people. So, so how does gender impact health? We've, I think we all agree we're all very different people, depending on the situation. Um, we have different characteristics. And uh, so the gender is actually something that's starting to in addition to sex, get some attention in terms of health outcomes. So this is published in Circulation, one of the top cardiovascular journals in the world. Um, and they talk about gender and sex as a social determinant of cardiovascular risk. Now, much of the literature looks at gender as a binary um, and really gender identity. So they talk about in this uh, article, which is very interesting, but you know how boys are more active than girls, basically starting from birth. And so these levels of activity have implications for uh, future cardiovascular risk. Girls are more likely, or teenage girls and young women are more likely to start smoking as a weight loss um, mechanism, if you will, which has implications for future cardiovascular risk. But it is a start. There are also, this is from the neuroscience uh, journals, talking about how gender actually leaves an epigenetic imprint on the brain. So epigenetic kind of means like it changes our DNA. So for example, mother rats uh, prefer their male offspring compared to their female offspring. And they typically have one or two male offspring who they prefer even among their male offspring. And they'll lick that male offspring more. Those male offspring have different DNA methylation patterns compared to the male offspring who don't get licked as much. And you can recreate it, and researchers have, by using a brush to pretend that you're you're a mother, I guess, licking your male offspring. Um, but to use a more human example, or more human, a human example, um, so women, and again, this is a binary, but women are more likely to have, or do, have higher levels of chemicals and BPA in their urine and blood compared to men. And when you think about it, it's a very gendered decision whether you paint your nails, wear makeup, apply lotion, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, similarly, they talk about alcohol exposure. So drinking a lot of beer is a very gender, I mean, has nothing to do with your DNA. But when you think about it, who do you think of when you think of going out on the weekends and just binging on beer? Now switch that with red wine, and who do you think of? So, okay. 
EGAL is a charitable organization. You've probably heard of GLAD, which is a US-based organization, but EGAL is for LGBTQI2S plus uh, people across the lifespan. Um, so for example, for any of you who are on the ward, you may have had um, encounters with patients who are doing really, really poorly at home, and it's very unsafe for them to return to their home. And we've talked, and you know, we talk about them going to an assisted care facility, which to everyone seems like the right thing to, right thing to do, except the patient doesn't want to go. And when you think about it, when we live at home, and I, I'm very guilty of this, it's only in the last year or so that this is sort of become apparent to me. When we live in our home, we can be whoever we want, we can dress however we want, we can call ourselves whatever we want. But when we move into, or, you know, move to an assisted care or any type of institutional care, suddenly you're a man or you're a woman, you're assigned a roommate, here's the barber, here's the hairdresser, here are your clothes. And you can see how, and then they have the tagline here, losing your independence shouldn't mean losing your identity. So just something for us to remember. CMAJ devoted an entire issue uh, in January to care of transgender, gender diverse, and non-binary people. And I just highlight one of the uh, articles. This is out of St. Mike's Hospital at U of T, uh, their primary care setting, probably the largest primary care practice in Canada. They, uh, there's about 15,000 people uh, included in this study, and it's primarily an inner city um, socioeconomically somewhat disadvantaged population just by virtue of where St. Michael's Hospital is in Toronto. So what they did though, it's a very simple study, is they gave people questionnaires in the waiting room and just said, can you fill this out? And basically they asked, what is your gender? They use categorical um, measures here. And what is your sexual orientation? Which some people would argue a better terminology would be se sexual identity. Um, and the idea was just to see how well how people self-identified matched with what was on the chart. That was their simple study question. And perhaps not surprisingly, the majority of the time, it did match. But a significant amount of the time, it did not match. So if you look on the, I'm going to step over here. You can hear me OK, I think. So up here it says female. So this is patients identified themselves as female. And then if you look at on here is what the chart said. So 95.7% of the time, there was matching, female versus female. But that means almost 5% of the time, there wasn't matching. So the patient thought they were, or felt she was a woman, and the medical chart didn't. And actually, they talk about how oftentimes, in particular, if someone is a trans woman or a trans man, they don't think of themselves as a trans woman or a trans, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a man. Um, whereas the chart would often say trans. Uh, for example. Um, and then uh, I only bring up the sexual orientation or sexual identity is about three quarters of people identif self-identified as heterosexual or, sh or straight, um, which means that 25% didn't. And I think it's just important to highlight we live in a very heteronormative society. And that means 25% of people don't fit that. So that's very, and this is, uh, anyway, just important to highlight. They also did 27 semi-structured interviews, um, and of the themes that came through, is 20, all these patients said that they really appreciated being asked these things, and this is something I think that Alberta Health Services, and I'm part of that, could learn from that. They felt that the fact that they were even asked reflected the inclusiveness of the organization, and it also sparked some curiosity about themselves. Um, some patients felt quite uncomfortable answering the questions, but for a different reason. So people who identified as L so I should LGB, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex, two-spirit, and plus to capture everybody. Um, for them, it evoked previous previous experiences of discrimination that they really wanted to bury, and they really didn't feel safe always identifying how they felt, how they identified. And there was a small number of heterosexual and cis patients who felt very uncomfortable with the questionnaire at all. Um, one of the things, basically, I, grew, I think one of the terms was, or phrases, I grew up in a home where a boy was a boy, a girl was a girl, you got married, you had kids, and that was it. So 
but that was a minority. Um, and then some patients didn't see themselves reflected in the options and thought that there should be more options. So basically have an other and please specify if you're going to ask. Um, so what about lab values um, in terms of changes in hormonal and metabolic parameters? So just a few studies I'll go through. So this was um, 21 on your left here, 21 um, trans women. Um, their lab values six months before and after starting hormone therapy. And so specifically, it would be estrogen therapy. They didn't specify what type of estrogen therapy. Um, and on your right is table two, and this is tiny, but I'll highlight what I want you to see, is 11 uh, transgender men. So men are generally on intramuscular uh, testosterone. I should mention that this is just what is prescribed. A large number of the trans population actually gets black market um, hormones because, again, afraid to go see their healthcare practitioners. And you can imagine how vulnerable you would feel going up and saying, and by the way, can I have some hormone therapy because I don't feel my gender uh, is, I, I don't feel, I, I feel I need that to um, feel more like myself. Um, and you'd be afraid of the reaction. So, but anyway, so in transgender women, so these are people who are born biologically male, who are women, um, so they want to go on gender-affirming therapy. I should mention, you'll see it's rife in the literature. You'll see cross-sex hormone therapy, transsexual. Those are very outdated terms. It's gender-affirming therapy. So um, these women actually had a decrease in their blood pressure. So I'm a nephrologist, so I really care about this. Uh, so they dropped by about six points in terms of systolic and four points diastolic. That's a big deal. Um, whereas in the transgender men, they actually had an increase in their blood pressure. Remember, this is 21 and 11 patients, so hard to know. In terms of serum creatinine, the creatinine stayed the same in the uh, transgender women. But in the transgender men, there was a significant increase by almost 30 points. Now, creatinine comes from your muscle mass. Testosterone increases your muscle mass. So it's hard to know if this increase in creatinine is truly a problem with your kidney function or it's just you have more muscle now. Um, this is another study from 2019. I mean, this is becoming a, an area of interest, I would say, in the medical literature. Um, so they had 312 patients. And the bottom line is they found that uh, in women, actually, the creatinine went down. And in transgender men, the creatinine actually went up. And then lastly, another the last study that I'll show you, where they actually looked at route of administration of hormone therapy. Um, and they found in transgender men, Creatinine went up and then stayed up 12 months later. In transgender women, creatinine stayed the same but then went down over time. Whether that's reflective of muscle mass or not, I don't know. So the short answer is, okay, so maybe it changed transgender, or excuse me, um, gender-affirming hormone therapy changes lab values, but the point is we actually don't know. So how do you interpret those lab values? And that is an area of uh, active interest. This is a case report that was published two years ago, which I do not know these authors, and I, I do not mean any disrespect, but I, I think there's a respectful way to report in the literature about what happens when a person decides to transition. So they come, this is the fourth case report um, of lupus that they highlight, um, of lupus nephritis that occurred in a person who... Uh, a transgender woman. So this woman was 27. She had been on estrogen therapy for nine years, and a year prior to presentation had actually had a gonadectomy. So she'd had her testicles removed. And then a year later, she suddenly got lupus nephritis. And they kind of write the whole article about how, well, it's probably because of her new sex hormones. And that could be true, or, or it just... But it's just important to be very sensitive about how people write these things. Um, because it's, or it could just be, it happened. Um, this was published in Annals of Internal Medicine, I guess two years ago now, it's 2018. It's an epi data set using the Kaiser Permanente uh, database from Georgia and California. And what they did is they looked at people who were assigned, who uh, had written down or who were entered as female or male, um, who later on were prescribed hormone therapy that was consistent with gender-affirming hormone therapy. And so they assumed those people were a transgender woman or a transgender man. And then they looked at health outcomes. So they talked about transgender women compared to, and they did 10 to 1, 
uh, transgender women compared to cisgender men as well as cisgender women and found that there was significantly more venous thromboembolism over the eight-year follow-up period, significantly more ischemic stroke, but no difference in myocardial infarction. So a little bit, you know, when we think of hormone, postmenopausal hormone therapy, that's kind of what we think about. Oh, it perhaps increases myocardial risk. But that doesn't appear to be the case in transgender women, according to this study. In transgender men, the event rates were so low that they couldn't actually comment on it. So hard to know. There has been uh, an editorial in this in a number of letters to the editor saying that Maybe this article shouldn't have been published, that they feel that people won't want to prescribe uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy due to potential risks now, and people are already afraid enough to come to the hospital or to see their physicians. I think it's good that things are being published, especially because this came out last year. There has been a spike in demand for treatment of transgender teens. So every tertiary care hospital across Canada, pediatric hospital, has a transgender clinic. And the only reason to refer a young person to that clinic is for prescription of either puberty blockers or gender-affirming hormone therapy. And they will not prescribe this until after the child is beyond the age of puberty. So there certainly are younger children who are gender questioning or, or they know, but they are not prescribed medication until the age of puberty. So just to give you an idea in terms of uh, the right, this is over a 12 year period, the number of referrals that have occurred across Canada. So in 2004, which is all the way on your left, it's almost negligible, right? And then you can see where we're at in 2016. And Calgary is kind of that middle green thing. So anyway, so all is to say for those of us in the room who treat adults as part of our practice, this is coming. This is not something that, you know, oh, this is a very specialized case. We are all going to need to know how to do this. And certainly CMPA, I just got an email yesterday, um, talked about how, uh, you know, the Responsibility, roles and responsibilities of healthcare providers in terms of treating trans patients and basically everybody is a patient and it's important we all know how to do it. Not outside of our scope of practice, but we need to be respectful and we need to at least refer the person so they do get the proper care. So just coming back to uh, the kidney population, again, we talked about the CKD epi formula, which is how we calculate GFR, or kind of percentage of kidney function. As you can see, you have to plunk in what it says gender, male, female. I don't know if it's supposed to be sex or gender, and I don't think the authors of the CKD epi formula know either. But gender is a very... Um, uh, controversial topic, so I thought we'd move on to something equally controversial, which is race. So um, whether someone's African American or not. So here's my favorite U.S. president, and who has a African father and a white mother. So is Barack Obama African American or not? And should I? Just, I have no idea what he thinks, by the way. Um, should I, looking at him, make that decision, or should he tell me what he thinks of himself? Because race is equally a social construct, right? Just like gender. And if you think, oh, well, you know, why is she talking about this? Well, this actually was talked about in JAMA last year, reconsidering the consequences of using race to estimate kidney function. So this is a very nice uh, graphic. So if a person, um, if I plunk in as a physician that someone is African American into that, uh, the CKD epi pop, uh, equation, suddenly their kidney function goes up by 18%. Um, and if I decide that Barack Obama is not African American, his kidney function goes down by 18%. Again, I know nothing about his health care, and I do not want to give that, uh, imply that at all. But this has implications in terms of drug dosing, uh, dial drug dosing, uh, referral to kidney transplant, referral for dialysis, um, referral to see a nephrologist in the first place. I mean, this has real world um, applications. And so I would argue that gender is the same thing. And again, moving outside the medicine thing. So I don't know if anybody here has been following Castor Seminaya's, um, uh, I say case, I don't know, story, I guess. So Castor Seminaya is a South African star in track and field. Um, and there are people who feel that she doesn't look woman enough. And so 
I don't know how this happened, but she ended up having her testosterone levels um, measured. Um, and they are, it's based on what I've read, slightly higher than what would, or outside the norm for a biological female, but significantly less than they would be for a biological male, human. Um, but based on this, the IAAF has said, if you want to compete, you need to take medication to lower your testosterone levels, which I'll say I think is absolutely blatantly ridiculous and criminal, truly, that you ask someone to alter their physiology uh, so they can compete in a sport. But anyway, so this has actually drawn medicine into it. So this is an editorial, which I highly encourage you to read. Uh, in the BMJ, Kara Tenenbaum is the Inst scientific director for the Institute of Gender and Health for CIHR. Um, and she actually told me she's actually gotten some hate mail because of writing this. So uh, just so you know, it's something that goes beyond medicine. So just to highlight, we like people to look a certain way. This is Castor Seminaya um, in, I'll call it a woman's magazine a few years ago. And, and here's another same person uh, published in Forbes, right? And so which one are we more comfortable with? Which one is a woman? Um, Castor Seminaya is a woman. She says she's a woman. So, um, And then I'll just leave you with, uh, so this is Ben Bars, who is, or was, I'm sorry to say, a very esteemed neurobiologist at Stanford uh, who published this paper, Does Gender Matter, in 2006, in kind of in response to the whole Larry Summers thing at Harvard about you know, different gendered brains, et cetera. Um, and Ben Bars unfortunately died two years ago of pancreatic cancer, but talked about how he gave a lecture. Um, and as he left the lecture, he heard some of his colleagues or people in the audience saying, you know, that was... Ben does such great work, really good, you know, just so much better than his sister Barbara's. And you know what? Ben used to be Barbara. So Barbara transitioned into Ben at age 42. And so Ben writes about his, you know, his experiences and really the respect that he suddenly started getting when he became Ben. Um, and so I, oh, I sorry, I say I was, I'll, I'll leave what happened with the case. So it's actually really not anticlimactic. So the patient and his wife insisted at this point he be referred for a transplant evaluation. And he was finally placed on the list a year later. Um, at that point, his GFR was either 18 or 13. He finally initiated peritoneal dialysis. His weight was now 45 kilograms. You recall he was 61 kilograms when he started. So this is an ill man. Um, and I would argue that Dialysis should have been initiated sooner. Um, and, you know, these were his GFRs at this point. And that's where the story ends. Uh, so um, the NIH just put this out in December of this year, sex in the kidneys. You really start need to start looking at sex differences in kidney function, et cetera. And they do comment on gender, but they comment that it's very hard to measure gender. So with that, I finish, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. I'm also cognizant we have another speaker. So, oh, but yes, did you? Oh, I think you had to say. Well, maybe we'll get Paula to come up here then. <laughs> Are we sure there's no questions for Dr. Ahmed before we go on? I don't think we have anyone left from the conference here, so we're kind of getting a point for each other. There you go. Okay. Let me put that down. And... Okay, so my name is Paula Pierce. I'm one of the geriatricians. And I've been asked to talk about the imposter phenomenon. And I'm, I'm speaking about this today under the umbrella of WellDoc Alberta, which is a collaboration of people interested both in physician health and um, medical education and um, collaborating to share resources across Alberta. And WellDoc Alberta is funded by Scotiabank in collaboration with MD Financial and the CMA. Um, but I personally don't have any um, financial conflicts related to this presentation. 
The whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. This idea of feeling like an imposter is nothing new. By the end of this session, I'm hopeful that people can explain the concept of the imposter phenomenon, to summarise the evidence for imposter phenomenon within healthcare, to evaluate the degree with which, as individuals, you may identify with these feelings, to determine the impact of imposter feelings on career progression, and to list strategies you may be able to use to mentor somebody with imposter feelings or help with self-reflection if those imposter feelings are yours and not your mentees. So to introduce it, um, I do a lot of both formal and informal um, mentorship with undergrad and postgraduate students. And I was finding a real theme of very highly functioning young physicians who seriously doubted their own competence despite having glowing evaluations and had turned down significant opportunities because they didn't feel capable. And I didn't really know how to mentor them. I felt much more comfortable mentoring the resident in academic difficulty. So when that became an issue in my own programme as programme director for geriatric medicine, I decided to do some reading to look at a workshop. So I'd just like you to think for a moment about kind of where you are in your career. Do you feel very happy with... Um, hmm. This screen isn't working. Never mind. Um, where you are in your career, your success, do you feel that it's deserved? Or do you feel that you are somehow here because of luck, some error, you were in the right place at the right time, or just people liked you? So because I want to be interactive, I would like to introduce you to Mentimeter. So I'd like you to go to your phones and I would like you to put into the code 550026 into menti.com. And really give a thought. Do you most identify with option number one, Margaret Thatcher, who very famously said, I wasn't lucky, I deserved it. Or do you most closely identify with Mike Myers, who said, at any moment now, I still expect the no talent police to come and arrest me. So in a way of getting some interaction in a very non-interactive possible environment, I'd just like you to give that some thought and to claim whether you are a Margaret Thatcher or a Mike Myers. And we're talking purely their views on confidence here, not their politics. I want to make that quite clear. <laughs> so we have four people, Mike Myers, no Margaret Thatchers yet. We have a Margaret Thatcher. It depends on the day. <laughs> Release your inner Margaret Thatcher that's in there. Okay. Is anyone else still fiddling with the software? Do we need a little bit more time? Okay. So roughly eight to three, more people feel that maybe they're not as comfortable with their own role and their confidence, that they don't feel I wasn't I was luck I wasn't lucky, I deserved it. They feel more I'm here by the grace of God or the skin of my teeth. So, what is imposter phenomenon? Well, it's a collection of negative feelings and subsequent behaviors that are driven around this pervasive idea that we're just not as good as other people think we are. Um, and it doesn't matter how many positive reinforcements we have, how many exams we pass, how many grants we, we, are, we are successful, how many publications, none of that relieves that internal feeling that you're just not good enough. And there's this constant fear that other people are going to find that out and expose us as a failure. So there's this fear of failure, but there's also a fear of success. Because if I'm successful, oh my word, I pulled that off. I've got no idea how I did it, and now they're going to expect that every single time. And that can actually drive anxiety rather than relieve the anxiety. So feelings and subsequent behaviors that we're not as good as other people think we are, we fear failure, but we also fear success. And this was first described in 1978 by Pauline Clance in a group of college-educated women. Um, 
and she designed the scale that is still most commonly used now. You can go to it online and you can do your own imposter phenomenon scale if you like. It is a Likert scale with a series of questions such as, I can give the impression that I'm more competent than I really am. Or, I avoid evaluations if possible and have a dread of others evaluating me, that fear of failure. When people praise me for something I've accomplished, I'm afraid I won't live up to their expectations, that fear of success. So having heard a little bit about it, I would like you to go back to Mentimeter. Let me hold tab. Tab. Go. Do you identify with, with feelings of imposterism? Is that, heck yeah, that's me. Oh yeah. Or no, but I do see it in other people. Or ah, what's that all about? You know, we have a few imposters in the room. And to be clear, this is nothing to do with being an actual imposter. Actually, people who identify with the imposter feelings are less likely to commit academic fraud and other forms of plagiarism. So virtually everybody who's answering feels, <laughs> yeah, I get that. And even if they don't, they see it in others. Okay. Thank you. The thing is with imposter phenomenon, it's not just the feelings, but it's the way the feelings drive maladaptive behaviours to cope with the, with, with the um, associated anxieties. And Valerie Young, in her Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, which I can highly recommend if you haven't read, outlined seven different ways that imposters alter their behaviour to stay one step ahead of the no-talent police. So first of all, we have over-preparing and hard work. So if I'm not as good as everybody else in the room, then I'm going to compensate for that lack by just working extraordinarily hard, and that will prevent people finding out that really I'm a bit stupid. So over-preparing and hard work. Holding back. Some imposters go to the other stage, but I'm not going to put the great deal of work in. What if I do all that work and fail anyway? I'd rather people think I'm lazy than know I'm stupid. So holding back. Maintaining a low profile. Can I choose a role or a career that flies under the radar? Can I work in a bigger group so I can disseminate the attribution of success and not have it laid on me if I fear success? If I can't maintain a low profile, can I change my profile so I might move from job to job from project to project, from research paper to research paper, before anyone actually realises I don't know what I'm doing in the role I'm in. Can I use charm or humour? Well, they're going to be kinder to me when I fail if they like me. Or my personal favourite, if I keep them laughing, they'll never know I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? Procrastination. Can I put off as long as possible that situation that will result in me being found out as a failure. The trouble with that then, I need to do things at the last minute. And then if I do things at the last minute, um, I have an inbuilt protective mechanism for if things don't go well. Well, that didn't go so well, but I'm hardly surprised. I just rushed it off at the last minute. Never finishing is the extreme end of procrastination. Only at this point, the, the task never gets finished. It never moves forward. The application never gets written. The paper never gets finished. And again, I have a protection. You don't like my work? But it's not finished yet. You don't like my conclusions. It's just a draft. I can protect myself from that criticism. And self-sabotage is the extreme end, where I might actually do things to undermine my own success. I might drink to excess and turn up hungover. And then, again, when things don't go well, then I have something to blame it on other than me. And some psychologists think that this concept of self-sabotage is one of the things that drives substance abuse as a way of avoiding success and therefore avoiding the emotional consequences of imposterism entirely. So I just want you to give a minute to think. You're kind of too scattered to talk to each other. But to just think in, in yourselves, do any of these seven maladaptive behaviours speak to you? 
And to go back to Mentimeter, and just think, do any of these actually speak to you? And just think for a moment, pop it in, and let's see. You can vote for more than one here. You can vote for as many as you choose. Is there anyone comfortable with sharing an example of how imposter phenomena has manifest in themselves procrastinating? Anyone comfortable to do that in this kind of group? If you are, you're not on your own. Sophia. I procrastinate. I grant all that I can grant. <laughs> Anyone prepared to talk about over-preparing? I'm curious because I think as physicians, we're often have perfectionism traits as well. Yeah. So that might overlap, but definitely the over-preparing because um, you always feel that you're not going to be good enough. Yeah. And, and you might over-prepare, say, a presentation, but you can't over-prepare for what questions might people ask you. And then that drives even more anxiety because there are things you can't prepare for. Yeah. But an interesting spectrum here. When I've done it before, it's been very much over-preparing, holding back, and use of charm. This is the first time that procrastination has been so strongly, strongly pushed. Was it different career stages? Mm. Ah. Ooh. I did not know it did that. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to move now on to the evidence for imposter phenomenon within medicine. And given how pervasive the feelings were, when I started reading, I thought there'd be quite a lot of evidence out there. And actually, there isn't. It's kind of a bleak landscape in terms of literature. Um, much of what has been done is done in general STEM fields. Most of the work in general is in psychology and business. Some undergrad stuff, general STEM fields, less in medical education, less still in residency, and very little in staff and faculty. Um, first looked at in 1998, 30% scored as imposters on the Clance Imposter Phenomenon Scale. Um, arbitrary value of 62 um, not really validated, but that's the level that all of the studies use. Um, and roughly two to one, female to male, 37.8 female students, 22% male students. This group of students, almost 30% of them, had significant levels of psychological distress. And interestingly, their score on the imposter phenomenon scale was their single highest predictor of psychological stress. More than age, stage of training, um, social support network, marital status, or even previous history of mental health concerns. So common and associated strongly with psychological distress. And this fits with evidence outside of the sphere of medicine, where people who score highly on imposter phenomenon traits, the darker line, score highly in agitation, apprehensiveness, dysthymia, perfectionism, as Jane said, and procrastination and strain. In 2004, people looked at family medicine residents, and again, quite high numbers, 41% of females, 24% of males, met, resident, met, met criteria for imposter phenomenon and associated with depression, anxiety, and poorer self-esteem. And interestingly, 60% of females and 43% of males did not believe they were ready for independent practice. And if you scored as an imposter... 75% of people with imposter phenomenon scores did not feel ready for independent practice, as opposed to only 40% who didn't score, despite all of them thinking <coughs> they were adequately trained. And when it comes to career planning, I want you to remember those statistics. 
Because if you've got a group of people, 75% of imposters don't think they're ready for independent practice, 40% of people who don't feel they're imposters don't feel they're ready for practice, which of those are likely to take on visible leadership roles or extra roles early in their career that will advance their career? It's likely to be the people who feel ready for independent practice. 2008, international medical residents, uh, sorry, <coughs> Internal medicine residents, this was the first time they looked at where you trained. And again, roughly half felt imposters, um, 52% female, 32% male. But on this time, looking at where you trained, only one international medical graduate did not score as an imposter. Approaching 90% of IMGs scored clinically significant imposter phenomenon scores. In 2016, again, back to undergraduates, common again, this time looking at ethnicity rather than just where you trained. And 30% of Asian and white students who formed the huge bulk of students, 30% scored as imposters. But if you were from another racial group, and in this group made only 4% of the total student population of black, Latina, First Nations, 72% identified as imposter phenomenon which is huge. The only one that's looked towards um, into staff, this is a very um, homogenous population, 70% male, 91% Caucasian. But this is the only study in medicine and one of the very few across professions that have shown no gender difference. And this also showed that imposter phenomenon was associated with burnout symptoms and tended to get better as you went from trainee to young faculty to more senior faculty. Um, I don't want to be rude about surgical training, but I just wonder to what degree surgical training is a war of attrition for people who really do not feel um, fully confident about their own competence. Um, Interestingly also, this was only carried out in two centres. Both of those centres had female chiefs of surgery, which also may not be entirely typical. So to summarise the evidence in medicine, it's common, it's associated with psychological distress, it's more prevalent in women, non-white, non-Asian race, and international medical graduates. And outside of of, um, the the medicine evidence, there's also shown first-generation professionals, first-generation who've gone beyond working-class roots, and and people who have had government-funded schooling. And what do these group of people have in common? It's essentially a lack of huge historical background in the system, if we like, the lack of strong role models within that system. And I don't think I can put it any better than Sonia Sotomayor, so I'll just let you read this. Yes, someone like me can do this. And until relatively recently, the majority of physicians were male and pale. So I'd like to go back to a bit of a reflective exercise. Um, Again, you can't really talk to each other because you're scattered, but I'd like you to think of some successes or achievements. And I'd like you to think about why you were successful. And then you know what's coming next, don't you? I'd like you to look at what factors played into your success and see if you're happy to do a quick text and share that. I like that. Hard work, hard work, a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So interestingly, is, every, is everyone fin is anyone still is anyone text like I do really slowly with one finger? No. Okay. It's interesting. None of these say because I'm really good, because I'm really smart, because I am better than the next person. These are all very external things. Very strong theme of I had a good support system, be, be it calling it family, friends, mentors, champion, support system. Very clear theme of external support. Very clear theme of hard work. None of this speaking to my ability had anything to do with my success. To see if there's any more. Yes, that'd be good. Let's see. Ha! Ah, mostly hard work. Seeing others from my background that we're successful too. Leaning on leaders from support and fortune, luck. Yeah. So, themes being a lot of hard work, external support system, a little bit of role modeling, and luck all to do with external. So I'm kind of guessing you might know what's coming next. Back up. Think of a failure. What factors played into your failures? So again, some pretty clear themes. Um, there's a lot of lacks here. Um, didn't prepare, not enough knowledge, not good enough. Very kind of things that are blamed. No, no, none of these said my family weren't supportive or I didn't have a good mentor. So it's interesting, isn't it? The difference how e even just randomly here that the themes of the successes are all putting it on what other people did for me and our failures about what I didn't do for myself. And then a couple of system level things. I didn't fit the mold. And there was one down here about had to overcome gender barriers. Does anyone want to share anything that they thought about when they thought about the difference between how they attribute their successes to attribute their failures? I appreciate it's hard in this kind of environment. But as I say, however you feel, you're clearly not alone. Yes, of course. Okay, I could remember. <laughs> I wrote lack of knowledge of the system. Because I think often, um, and maybe that plays into um, if, you're, if you do have some imposter phenomenon, you think that you're, it's that unworthiness factor that you go, okay, you go out and ask, and, and it's bi directional.
Can I ask, is it something you would have considered a failure, say, 10 years ago? 10 years ago, it probably would have tried. Right. So, I mean, I did something last week. I was pulling out of the blind world to um, an audition for something. And I never would have, I probably would have done that. Yeah. So, I wouldn't consider a failure at that. Yeah. Other than you could follow up on that in the try to think about things I've failed at. I can't really think of much that I would consider a failure, but I think that's maybe because I'm not so sure. And I'm only doing things that I know for sure that I'm going to be good at. Mm. Um, so I'm not even putting myself up for things, I think, because yeah. I'm scared that I'm going to get found out if I even try. Holding back. Yeah. Yeah? Back. Yeah. And when we move on to careers, then taking risks and being out there gets noticed for certain roles, whereas holding back is safe, but may not lead to great progression. That's one of the issues around the imposter phenomenon and career planning. Thank you all for your uh, input there. So, I quite like this one. <laughs> kind of cute. So now I want to move on to imposterism and career progression. Um, initially, it wasn't clear whether, um, when it came to careers, people would go for maladaptive behavior number one over preparation and have this great career strategy mapped out to overcome their insecurities, or whether it would be more holding back and not putting yourself forward, particularly for visible leadership roles, because of fear they're just not good enough. This is me trying to choose between two sausage rolls in the northeast of England. You can take the girl out of Yorkshire, but you can't take Yorkshire out of the girl. Um, and again, there's no literature. It's another bleak landscape. So when we look at imposter phenomenon and general medical career planning, um, studies within the general work environment show that people with higher imposter phenomenon scores are actually less likely to have good career planning, a good career strategy, and less motivation to lead. They are more likely to stay in their current role rather than risk being found incapable in a more visible leadership role. And given that a good career plan and strategy is one of the strongest predictors of career progression, if you don't have a strategy, you are less likely to progress. And if we look back at the group of people if that group of family medicine residents who didn't feel ready for independent practice, that if you don't feel ready for independent practice, it is likely that you have less motivation to lead and therefore you are less likely to progress. And if that group of people is preferentially including women, non-white, non-Asian, um, first-generation professionals, publicly educated um, international medical graduates, if those people are disproportionately lagging in their career, then you end up with a lack of diversity further up the chain. And this is another way of looking at it, that you're given a task, you feel anxious, you manage in one of these maladaptive ways, over-preparing, procrastination. Um, you achieve success, but you feel relief because it's not been due to I'm any good, it's due to I worked hard and I was lucky, so I'm less likely to take on these tasks, these leadership roles, and promotion. And this is considered significant enough that in a very recent position paper from the American College of Physicians identi um, that identifies imposter phenomenon as one of the critical barriers to career success in achieving gender equity, career success in women. So it's the last reflective exercise now. Are you keeping time for me? No. Oh, well. Um, List examples of ways imposter feelings have held you back or impacted your success. So. Yeah. 
normally times it on the slideshow, but my screen here isn't working, so I've got no idea how long I've been talking. Okay, but I don't know when we started, because we were start you started we started super late, didn't we? Okay. So quite a theme here of people not even applying, didn't apply for advancement, not submitting applications, didn't even try for a position, been in the same role for six years. This idea that somebody with imposter feelings is more likely to stay where they are than risk being found out in a higher um, role. Not speaking up in meetings is an interesting one. And I bet if you do speak up in meetings, it starts with, I might not be right here, but, or I'm sorry, or this is only my opinion, but, that when you do speak up in meetings, it's qualified in some way. Let's just scroll down, see if there's any more before we move on. Okay. So quite a lot of, even in a, you know, higher level audience, people are feeling restricted by imposter feelings preventing advancement in their career. So now last, last looking at how we can mentor people who identify with imposterism. So first of all, we can name it and normalize it. A bit like Jumanji, those of you who've seen the movie, if you haven't, it's excellent, you should. Um, name it and normalize it. Um, the vast number of people in this room have had imposter feelings at some point in their career and may actually have ongoing struggles with imposterism. And yet when, when juniors look at people in faculty positions or more senior positions, that they don't see someone who's doubting their, comfort, you know, their own competence. They just see someone who's competent. When I did this with my trainees, I had one tra trainee who just didn't feel imposter at all very quietly confident, not cocky, quietly confident. But that person was horrified by the degree of things he was seeing his peers write and how they felt when he knew they were perfectly, well, highly functioning colleagues. So it can, it can be eye-opening to a trainee to realize that their role models can also have these feelings and yet be successful. So name it and normalize it. Secondly, challenge negative self-talk and reframe self-criticism. So people with imposterism tend to give these global feelings of their own um, success. So for example, I totally botched that presentation. Call them on it. You know, I've heard from nobody that you totally botched that presentation. Do you mean there are a couple of things you'd like to do differently? Reframe their self-criticism. Okay? Or they tend to go, I don't know what all my other colleagues know. I'm so stupid. Reframe it. Well, how are you going to learn that? So just try and stop that negative self-talk. Normalize and model lifelong learning and imperfection. So um, we're so good at presenting the best versions of ourselves that we possibly can, that that's all that other people see. And then they feel isolated because I'm never going to be like that. I gave a talk about frailty in preoperative assessment to an internal medicine conference. And one of the residents came up to me afterwards and said, how can you stand up there and just talk like that? Said, what do you mean, just talk like that? I prepared the bejesus out of that. And we're not 
we're not confident in admitting to when we've put a lot of work into something or when we've got something that isn't perfect. We wouldn't show a work in progress. We were, we don't, we're not good enough often at saying, I don't know that. So just sometimes model the need for lifelong learning and that imperfection. Take note of achievements and focus on strengths. And that's a little bit of what you've been doing in terms of, I don't just have to celebrate when I'm successful, but celebrate giving something a go. Celebrate trying something. Not just achieving funding, but getting the grant submitted. Okay? Um, get trainees to update their CVs. Make them put these objective measures of success down on paper. My division head, Jaina holroyd Leduc, has started a beautiful new tradition when our fellows graduate from the program of giving them a beautiful glass bowl and coloured glass pebbles and instructs the fellows that when they're the staff and they're not getting any feedback from anyone, um, they have to internalise that feedback. So when they have a great day, they make a great diagnosis, they mediate a difficult family meeting, they have an end-of-life conversation that goes really well, they get a thank you letter, that when they're feeling good about what they've done, put something in the jar and keep it visible. So when they come back and sit in their office and going... I am such a terrible physician. I missed that diagnosis. They can at least look at something visible and say, but I'm not always like that. Because we have a tendency to put our thank you letters, our positive feedback in a drawer, never to see the light of day again. But our failures, we carry with us every single day. So take note of achievement and focus on strengths. Separate self-worth from achievement. That I, as a person, am more than my success in my career, okay? And to try and do other things that make us feel good, that give us confidence. And if all else fails, just act confidently. Put on your PowerPoint, you know, your, your power pants, fake it till you make it. Teach trainees to not start meeting conversations with, I might be wrong, but. Dress the part, look the part, act confidently. So in summary, imposter phenomenon is common. It exists throughout the spectrum of medical practice. It disproportionately affects women, international medical graduates, non-white race, and first-generation professionals. And the fact it disproportionately affects those group of people and it negatively impacts career progression, this may be a barrier to diversity within our workforce. Thank you.